Everyone can please settle down. All right, first of all, I want to apologize. Because I, <laughs> I know there's a lot of people standing, there's a lot of people in the back, there's people fighting over the seats. I think it's beautiful. I think we're all fighting to hear words of Torah, words of elevation. I, I think it's really special. And I just want everyone to keep in mind, please, that this whole event was designed by Shem Shammai, the Lev Torah. So it's very easy to get a little upset if you expect it to be in the front to back. I can promise you it doesn't matter. You're going to feel the energy in the room, the people we have in this room. And I'm not only talking about the three speakers, I'm talking about everybody in the room. Uh, is a special person, and you're going to feel the energy regardless. If you're in the back, if you're in the front, if you're standing or, or sitting. Within five, ten minutes, you're going to be in a flow state, you're going to be in a zone, and you're going to be thrilled that you're here. So, everyone. <laughs> so, I, uh, usually I wing things, but I'm not really the speaker tonight, so I wrote something uh, about a half hour ago, because I do want to acknowledge certain things that I wrote over the time. Um, first, I'd like to welcome you all to a night of inspiration. <laughs> to be honest with you, it's really remarkable that we're all here. I promise I'm not exaggerating, it's a complete miracle. It took dozens and dozens of miracles, things we could not prepare for, things we could not plan for, things we could not think of, not only to make this night happen, but to physically get us all here, I meant. Take my word for it, I've been heavily involved in every detail of this event and the whole weekend for the past 10 months. And I'm telling you, the entire thing was not out of control. <laughs> Absolutely nothing was out of control. And the reason I'm sharing this with you is because the goal of tonight is to elevate, of course, the glory of Hashem, it's to increase our minats, to increase our yidat And this is Hashem's event, literally. There's no promotion here, there's no ego here. Literally, Hashem is hosting the event, Hashem coordinated it, Hashem secured the speakers. We had 15 speakers, and then all of a sudden this fell through, and this one came in, and then this one came in. Saying Hashem, everything just sort of fell into place. So it's a very, very special situation we had. Hashem sold the tickets, raised the money, secured the days running the event. Every nuance that we didn't plan or expect happened, and it worked for our benefits. I just wanted to acknowledge that at the beginning, that it's truly a miraculous event. I'm so happy we're here, all here, and we're lucky, so thank you, Hashem. Okay, secondly, I have to thank the human beings who did their stuff loop. So I have to thank the entire FDY family, Maga David Yeshiva family. This is the elementary school. The board, the staff, the incredibly kind hospitality. The ease in which this was coordinated and executed was phenomenal. And the kindness and generosity of how they opened it up with happiness was really amazing. So thank you to Matt and David. I also want to thank the Fax Brothers who set up the sound systems and the screens upstairs. Even though everyone like egged the screens, I won't tell them. Chat Charity who coordinated the ticketing system. And the Mojo Media who's filming it. And also we're doing live stream to spread this around the world as much as we can and everyone else involved. And I apologize if I missed anyone. I, like I said, I quickly typed this out, but I'm not worried because I spoke to every person privately that I had to thank you so much because I'm telling you, it's crazy that we're here and I can't believe it. So I'm just taking this in right now. The first person I have to thank, I'm not sure where he is, is Rabbi Malka. New Jersey and literally have to swim under the Verrazano to get here. <laughs> so we all have to be very happy that Rabbi Mark is here. Let's go. Let's go. I don't need to say it. I also want to say to Rabbi Salom and Ruth and his family and his team for making their way all the way from the Holy Land. Yeah? yeah. <laughs> It's very, very, very difficult in general to come from the Holy Land here. The Rav really and his team put their heart into it to come visit us. I am not exaggerating. Texas wanted them, LA, Miami, five, six states, the UK, and it shows us. So we really got to appreciate it. And I'm saying this humbly. I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that I don't know about, but in my humble opinion, Rav Shalom Arush is the greatest. 
the reason I want to set the stage is let's be mindful. We're, we're, we're about to be in a room with a person that every minute that you live in, every word that comes out of you is precious, it's wisdom, it's deep, it penetrates your heart. And it might come out as very simple, a lot of the ideas that if you, you open your mind, your heart is so when you listen, it's it's very deep and there's a lot of power behind it. So I want to change, like I said, that's some of my roots and standing. I also want to thank the Valley Fence there for coming. their pains and joys with the Rav and express their hopes and dreams. And I realize we're truly the children of Hashem, we're truly united together, and while to the naked eye it might seem like we're all different, some of us are Middle Eastern, some of us are European, some of us are ultra-religious, some of us are Reformed, some of us were born Sadiqim, and some of us were Baal Teshuvah. While to the naked eye we might look different, in reality we're all one, and our souls are all one, and we're the same. I saw that we're all just trying to be our best and become our best and do our best and make the world a better place for ourselves and our loved ones. And that's why Hashem loves us, I think. I think Hashem wants to be with us because He sees us. We want to be better. Hashem, we want to connect. We want to understand. And we're all united, sometimes without even knowing it, but we're united in that way. I'll share one last thing. I'm sorry. I know I'm going over, but I, my heart, I know it's worth it, and I, and I want to share it because I have everyone listening. When I was walking home from shul with Rav Arush on Shabbat, you know, I've been coming up with random questions throughout the weekend. I asked the Rav, I said, Rabbi, what's the Shekhinah? Like, I always hear, Hashem, Shekhinah, is, is it Hashem? Is it separate from Hashem? Is it a part of Hashem? They say the Shekhinah comes down, it goes up. What is the Shekhinah? So Rav Arush stopped for a second, and he said, it's the collective soul of the Jewish people. Wow, what? It's the collective soul of the Jewish people? Guys, think about this. Do you realize how mind-blowing this is? That explains why hatred between Jews destroyed the temple. That explains why the Shekinah comes down when two people learn Torah, when ten people pray, when homes have shalom bayi, a husband and wife. The Shekinah is the unity of human beings, of, of the Jewish people. I thought that's mind-blowing. 
So I wanted to point this out before we start so we could appreciate what we're doing. The holy books say that when Mashiach comes, Hashem's going to gather the Jews from all four corners of the earth, which we can now understand why the Shekhinah comes out of exile at that point because all the Jews will be together in one place, right? We'll be united. So I want to point one thing out and then I'm done. Thanks for your patience. I looked at tonight's ticket list. I looked at it. I studied it. We have Syrian Jews, Moroccan Jews, Lebanese Jews, Iranian Jews, Egyptian Jews, South African Jews, Spanish Jews, European Jews. We have people from Lakewood, from Muncie, from Brooklyn, from New Jersey, from Manhattan, from California, from Florida. Forgive me for saying this. I hope it's proper, but I'm saying it regardless because it's from my heart. To me, this event is a microcosm of Mashiach. Where all Jews coming together to, in unity just to get elevated. Learn Torah, get inspired, get closer to Hashem, connect, learn, grow. It's beautiful. So thank you for coming. I'm sorry we're squished, but I'm not, because it's also anyway. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Rabbi Moshe Malka, a local community leader, having a rabbi, motivational speaker, and a beautiful man and soul. Isaac, that was truly beautiful. <clears throat> it come from good stock, Jack and Joyce. The cousin, <clears throat> the president of our shul and deal, who I'm so grateful to you. Tonight, you all came out for one reason only, to hear words of Emet. You're looking all for the truth. Emet begins with an Aleph and a Mem, and ends with a tough. You know why? Because from the beginning of your life, from the day you came from your aim, Aleph Mem, till your final day, Mem Tough Met, you're looking for Emet. And that's why you all came, to be Marbe Kevot Shamayim. At first, I'd like to acknowledge the presence of my M, my mother who's here tonight, who guided us in the ways of Emunah, and my dear wife, who's the M of all my family and children. Gedalia, with your permission, what you've done for Am Yisrael is truly a Kiddush Hashem. Hashem bless you to continue with all your strength. This is Kavot Shamayim. Moshe Rabbeinu tells us, Hatsur Tamim Pa'olo, the rock, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, El emuna ve'en avel. God Almighty, who's tzaddik v'yashar. Hashem does everything right, without any crooked, without any wrong. David HaMelech echoes the same words. On Friday night, we say, Mizmor, Shili Yom HaShabbat. And we end with the words, Lehagid ki yashar Hashem. God is yashar. Suri, he's my rock. Velo avlatabo. There's no wrong in him. There's no iniquity. He's not crooked. And I come to ask this honored kahal a simple question. There's something wrong with the context. It doesn't sound right. Imagine you're looking for a new son-in-law. And you look at the resume. Sadiq, Yashar, Chacham. He's holy. He doesn't rob banks. He doesn't rob banks. I had that get in. Hakadosh Baruch Hu is Tzuri. He's tamim, tzaddik, yashar, velo avla. Avla means crooked and wrong. Crooked and wrong in the same sentence? How'd that get in there? And I heard from a great Rabbi Yosef Zalman Bloch. He wrote a sefer on Egeret al Tachon. And he says something phenomenal. <clears throat> Picture the scene. Imagine for a moment <clears throat> you're driving back from New York City. You make a wrong turn, it's the middle of the night. And you end up on 130th Street in Morningside, and you're stuck in Harlem, and you look at your car, it's not starting. The car's dead. You look at your phone, oh my goodness, I can't charge it. You have 1%. You feel your wallet, you left it on your night table. You have 1% left on your phone, you know you have one phone call for a bailout. Your friend, he lives in Midtown, Manhattan. You think for a second, I think he's the guy. You call him up. You tell him, Joe, I'm stuck. It's Dave. I'm on the corner of 130th and Morningside. My car's dead. My phone has 1%. It's about to die. I have no money on me. Come and get me. 
At that moment, the phone goes dead. So I said, what happened? Who's that? My friend Dave, he's stuck. If you were that guy, Joe, what would you have to do? You have to go get the guy. You might not owe him anything. But for the mere reason that he is completely reliant on you, and you know that he has no one else but you, how could you not come? If you turn over and go back to sleep, you know what that's called? That's called avla. That's called wrong. It's just wrong. You know what Moshe Rabbeinu is saying? HaKadosh Baruch Hu is Hatsur Tamim Pa'ulo. El Emuna. He's a God who's faithful. The En Avel. He won't wrong you. On one condition. Lagid Ki Yashar Hashem Tsuri. If your full faith is in Him and no one else. If it's fully reliant on God 100%, how could he let you down? But imagine if the fellow told Joe, I have other options. He said, so, so take an Uber, it's expensive, it's $50. If you have other options, Joe doesn't feel compelled. He might even turn back over, he's got other ways. But if he knows he has no other way, how could he go back to bed? And that's what the great David HaMelech, Moshe Rabbeinu, is telling us this message. And the big question is, how do you get to the level of full reliance? You see, once you're on that level of fully reliant, you're tranquil, you're peaceful, you're not subjected to anybody. You're actually independent, the real independence. That doesn't come easy. That's why you need the great Rabbi Shalom, whose books again and again you read and you learn. You listen to Gedalia every day, every day, insistent every day. You don't change your mindset by a few speeches. Nobody changes from a speech. Who gave the greatest speech in history? God Almighty at Mount Sinai said, I am the Lord who took you out of Egypt. You shall have no other gods. What happened 40 days later? They went back. You know why? You only change with the work. The work of every day. The work. Every day of learning and growing and staying calm and knowing it's not random what happens to you. You see, once you know it's Hashem, and Hashem is good, Already you alleviate 50% of your stress goes away. I'll give you an example. Imagine you went to the dentist. The dentist says, open your mouth. And now he extracts a tooth. You say, Doc, what was that for? No reason, adding it to my collection. <laughs> How would you feel at that moment? Oh, I killed the guy, crazy? My tooth, you'd be upset, you'd be angry. He tells you, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Look at the computer skill. Look at the screen, you see? That tooth is infected and impacted. I'm taking it out, I'm saving you a year of pain. What do you tell them? Thank you. It's the same tooth. Imagine walking in the street. As you're walking, somebody knocks you down. You want to get up and punch him. At that moment, you're on the floor. A bullet whizzes over your head. What do you tell the guy? Thank you, my God, you saved me. You see, my friends, it's not the tooth that causes you pain, and it's not the knockdown that causes you pain. The suffering is the lack of knowledge that Hashem is doing it for your good. Once you know it's for your good, then you're already calm. The anxiety starts to leave. Entry level faith is to acknowledge Hashem. Walk in the street, there's a Borei Olam. Second level is where you have a relationship with Hashem. A relationship means when you eat and drink, you don't just say, Baruch Ata Adonai. Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Shehakol Nihiya Bidvaro. When you're thanking and you're in that mode and you're grateful, you know what the expert level is? The highest level is when things don't go right, when things are going wrong. And you still force yourself to say, Gamzu letova. It has to be for good. Once you're on that level where you're saying, Gamzu letova, you know Hashem will respond with good. Letova means there is no Rabba Olam. You have to get to that level where you know. But if it's random and it happens to you, it's painful. I heard Gadali say many times, things don't happen to you. Things happen only for you. You see the difference? To you and for you on the surface seem the same, but they're completely opposite. To you is painful, it's random, I fell, I'm hurt. For you, wow, he's helping me. You breathe, you inhale emunah, you exhale anxiety. 
Two different words, two you, four you. I remember when we were younger, a rabbi gave us a test on Bereshit. He said, Vayichal Elokim Bayom HaShivi'i. What's the meaning? We said, Vayichal Elokim Hashem finished creating the world. Bayom HaShivi'i. He crossed it out. He said, no, Vayichal Elohim means Hashem completed the creation. Like rabbi, complete and finish is the same thing. He said, no, they're very different. One day you're going to get old and get married. If you marry the right woman, you complete. You marry the wrong woman, you finished. <laughs> and if the right woman sees you talking to the wrong woman, you completely finished. <laughs> you see how one word, to you or for you, it's totally opposites. If you understand that, your life becomes pleasant. The woman in deal lost her taste in COVID. She was a chef, she was cooking. She couldn't smell or taste. She was very, very annoyed. Six months, nine months, everyone got their taste back. She didn't get a taste. And the complaints and the negativity. I can't, Hajj, what? I can't, how come everybody who the complaints? She went to a rabbi. The rabbi told her, step number one, P and C. Be positive, no complaining. Stop complaining. Be positive now. How can I be positive if I can't taste smell? The Chacham told her, God gifted you with five senses. Look, you see, you smell, you taste, you hear, you touch. God took two of them. Imagine you took your hearing and your sight. She's like, oh my goodness. Say, thank you, you could see. Stop complaining and start thanking. Because when you complain, God gives you more reasons to complain. But when you thank, He gives you more reasons to thank. And that's what the rabbi told you. You know what she did? She stopped complaining. She put a big sign, PNC. Positive, no complaints. Thanking, thanking. Six months later, she's taking out the trash. She opens it up, she said, I, I can smell! Her husband thought she was mad. She's dancing around the garbage can. She's so happy. Why? She shifted. What you think about, you bring about. And that's what Hashem wants from us. A person who lives like that, you'll always be happy. And I'll end with a great Rosh Hashiva. His name was Rabbi Palm. <clears throat> he lived on Ocean Parkway. And the rabbi once went to a wedding of one of his students, was a very wealthy man. And he loved art, and he designed a beautiful kitubah made of stunning art. And he paid maybe five to ten thousand dollars for the kitubah. As the witnesses began to sign, something must have happened. They signed maybe in the wrong place of the chatan. And the rabbi looks at the document and says, oh, "We can't use this kitubah." What? What? The guys? Why not? It's pasul. He pulled out a ten dollar kitubah from his briefcase and said, "This is what we're going to have to use." And the man's face turned white. You saw that. Anger in his face. Now it's his daughter's wedding. And he's about to march down the aisle. And he's upset. And the great Rosh Hashiva, in his wisdom, whispered into the man's ear for 60 seconds. The guy looked at the rabbi and said, Okay, really? He smiled. Oh, He started going down the aisle. Changed from negative to positive. Somebody asked him after, What did the rabbi tell you in 60 seconds? The Chacham said, must be there was a Gezera in the Shamayim that your daughter is going to have to write two Ketubahs. Thank God tonight she wrote them and not become a widow or a divorcee. And the man started thanking. You see how you shift the brain? That's wisdom. That's Emunah. And if you do that and live like that, you don't need anything else. You don't need addictions. You don't need any types. And they say the joke of the guy who's addicted, you know, too much. Some people in every type of industry, even football, the Super Bowl, have my boys here from Maori Yeshiva who just played their football game. And the boys, they love football. And one of these boys, he goes now into a Super Bowl game. He gets into the Super Bowl. He's all the way on the top of the bleachers. As he's looking down, he's, he's trying to get in. He goes, he makes his way. He can't believe his eyes. He sees on the second row, there's an empty seat. It's like, this is my lucky day. He sneaks down past all the guards. He sits down in the seat and makes himself comfortable. And all the gentleman looks at him and he asks the man, is it okay if I sit here in the seat? The guy tells him, it's okay, son. My wife and I, for 40 years, we didn't miss the Super Bowl. We were together. Alas, she passed away. Now the kid's a little uncomfortable. He looks up. He says, you sure it's okay? No relatives, no friends? Oh no, said the gentleman. They're all at the funeral. <laughs> this guy's it. Such addictions. Come on. Let's review what we learned tonight. <clears throat> all right, calm down. Full reliance on a Kadosh Baruch Hu brings results. 
Full reliance. La gid ki yashad suri ve lo avlata. Full reliance. How to get there? Step one, acknowledge. Step two, have a relationship. Thank, thank. Step three, when things don't go your way. Insist on gamzul etova again and again and again. And if you do it completely, remember, the woman, she shifted. Thank you, thank you. I could smell two kitubas. Must be a gizera. Gamzul etova. With that, you'll always be on top and always be happy. And that's the lesson of emuna. In English, emuna is faith. F-A-I-T-H. Forward all issues to Hashem. <laughs> Yeah. Toby. Okay, Dalia. Maybe put it on this side. What if you want? No, because he's done with it. Hi, everyone. Yeah, the best. My name is Toby Rubenstein. And on behalf of Siri Sis Braha and the Dali team, sure. I just want to welcome sure. you tonight for an incredible evening. We had a little shift, and Rabbi Rubens is going to go after the Dalia. But six years ago, the Dalia told me to divorce my past and marry my future. And I listened. And thank God for Hashem, I'm married to my husband, Felipe Orna. Three years ago, I was diagnosed with stage four uterine cancer. And the doctor told me, rise above nature. And I did, and I listened. And thank God today, I am cancer free. So happy to be here. What an amazing crowd. Isaac Kassin, you did it, you pulled it off. Amazing. Isaac was trying to call me about this event. I said, Isaac, I just got hit with a hurricane. Do you understand? If you figure it out, I'm going to show up for two days, you make it happen. And he absolutely made it happen. We originally were supposed to be in Carnegie Hall tonight but they wanted us to wear masks. So I said, I'm not, doing, I'm not going back two years. No way, no way now. I said, give me back my 60 grand and I'm not wearing a mask. And that's what happened. So Isaac made it happen with miraculously in what, a, a month, two months, he made this whole thing happen. And I gotta give him a lot of credit, how he got Rabbi Rush to come here. The, the whole thing is just magical. Um, I, can't, I can't tell you, just to be in the room with Rabbi Rush, what treat you guys are in for. There's, there's no words on to speak about the Koach of Rabbi Rush. First, I have to thank my wife for allowing me to come and being an amazing mother and wife and constantly pushing me, giving me the Moroccan heat that I need, <laughs> being the great coach that I need. And may all you married that you should all have wives that will push you to the next level. Stop hanging out with cheerleaders, guys. Get serious. Enough. I was by the Lubavitch Rebbe's site today, and there was, a, there was a bunch of college students that came in. I can't tell you the pain I had just watching them. The, the pain of this new generation, what I see, lost. It, it literally, I felt like it was an, I was in a flood. And I said, what are we going to do with so much darkness in this world? The only thing we could do is create light. But there's a lot of darkness out there. And the reason why I'm so into these classes and so into Rav Nachman's teachings is because when you show up, the world's going to show up for you. 
When you have spiritual growth, that's going to lead you to growth. And once you start growing, you're going to start giving, and then you'll be part of the repair instead of part of the despair. So growth is non-negotiable. I don't care if you're Syrian, Moroccan, what's going on in your life. You have to grow. It's non-negotiable. And this is why it's such an important message. Today all we're doing is blocking growth. We're blocking it out. And we're saying, this is okay, it's not so bad. Forget about the substances, forget about this. You're stopping growth. When you stop growth, you stop giving. And let me explain to you something very simple. The way you feel about yourself is the way you treat others. Bottom line. I know myself, when I'm, when the more work I, I put on myself, the more prayers, the more I work on myself, the more I understand people instead of judge, judge me, judging people. The more I see the bigger picture, I give benefit of the doubts before I would say, look what that guy's doing to me. So it, it changes the world. The whole world was created for you, but not about you. And this is a very, very important message why we have to all grow. We can't, it's non-negotiable. And whatever it takes to grow, you, have to, you need the right advice. And I think Rabbi Rush has sold millions and millions of copies of his book. And tonight, we are in the garden. Not the Madison Square Garden, La Havdil. We're actually gonna get something out of it, not watch the Knicks lose. <laughs> but this is the real garden. The garden is mean to be absorbed in light. Love and light. This is exactly how we're supposed to walk out of Torah classes, with love and light. We shouldn't walk around, what, what time is it over, what time is it here, what time is there. We're all over the place. And I see that. I see what Rav Nachman's teachings have, have absolutely changed my life, and I think they're going to change yours. Because you can have everything, even Tom Brady. He's got eight Super Bowl wins, he can't even have Shalom Bayit. So you, you can see, you can be an eight-time Super Bowl winner, and you still can't even pull out Shalom Bayit. So the reason, seven, what's the difference? <laughs> Don't worry, the Jets are not going to have any. Don't worry. So the whole, the whole point, the whole point of this, of these teachings, is focus on a conscious change. Number one thing you should focus on is how is my consciousness? How am I viewing the world? What consciousness am I holding? When you change that, you change everything. I have personally watched Rabbi Rush at my house several times over the past, I believe I've known him for 10, 12 years. And I've seen many, many people come through the door, many, many people, and it seemed that the same recipe was given to them. And they're saying, Rabbi, my mother-in-law is staying for six months. Do his both the dudes. <laughs> Rabbi, my wife is going, going blitzing me every down. Do his both the dudes. Rabbi, my business is down. Do his both the dudes. The whole point of his teachings, and this is what changed about me, because if, if I look at winners, I'm seeing how in the world did Rabbi Rouge sell four or five million copies of this book? I mean, it's not easy to sell this kind of book, but what is so much about this Garden of Amuna? What is, what, what is, what is the, what is, what is the magic, what's the magic about being in Amuna? It's, it's finally, you're attacking the issues in a spiritual way instead of shooting the messengers. And, and this is exactly why his books are so, are, are so great. Because any time that we are blaming anybody in our lives, or blaming any situation, we lack Amuna. If we lack Amuna, we lack salvation. And this is such a different way of looking at it. I'm going to show you today, I'm going to show you many, many lessons on, on how to draw vessels into your life. I'm going to give you an example of a typical prayer. I'm going to try to get into the details. Not just put it out there, but really, really go into the details of why am I not attracting things. The majority of the world is looking at the telescope all day long. I want this, I want that but nobody's looking at the microscope. Everybody's got a telescope. Oh, look at that guy's life. Look at his, look at his, look at his. Did you look into the microscope lately? Did you see why you're not attracting? All day long, everybody's got telescopes. But micros microscopes, no, not for me, not for me. This is not our way, like, like the common people say. This is not our way. 
The bottom line is, it's not about more light. It's, you have to ask yourself, what's blocking the light? That's really the question. The soulmate is out there, the parnas is out there, the zivug is out there, everything is out there. But something is blocking it. Something is blocking it. When you take this focus, and you focus inward, then everything changes. The minute you are focused outwards, you're looking at the telescope and not looking at the microscope. And this is exactly what I tell people all the time. What, where are you focusing? There's a reason why I'm not attracting that person. There's a reason why. Because remember, in life, we're always attracting something to us, good or bad. Energy just doesn't go away. It's either positive or negative. It just, energy doesn't disappear. Energy is either you're pulling something in or you're pushing something out. And that was, whoa, that was a big deal for me because I realized if I'm always pushing something in or pushing something out, pulling something in or pushing something out, then I should be very mindful of what, what's going on. Where am I vibrating every single day? So this is the whole point of this class really is to get you to a point of a, more of attraction and less chasing. Our sages tell us this all the time. Whatever you run after runs away from you, period. The more you want to be liked, the less people want to like you. The more you want to sell, the less people want to buy from you. The more honor and respect you want from your husband, the less you're going to get it. Because you don't say it, you attract it. And when you start becoming niji, and, and why are you not giving this? How come nobody's hanging out with me? How come this? How come I'm so alone? The solution for being alone, lonely is to be alone, to recognize what am I attracting? That's the purpose of doing is bodhidut. That's the purpose of looking in the microscope, looking and seeing what's happening. When you see that, everything changes. But I can tell you the majority of the calls we get, what am I going to do with this person? What am I going to do with that person? How come this is happening? We, we, we need to focus really, really on the change. Don't focus on what you want. Focus on the change that you want in your life. And this is so, so important. The reason why Rabbi Rush has books are, are so powerful, either the Garden of Gratitude or the Garden... Why is he talking so much? Where have you heard of a rabbi talk so much about complaining? You, you, you don't hear it that much. You learn Torah, learn more Torah, learn this, give stuff. But why is, what's the problem with complaining? Why is Rabbi Rush talking so much? What I try to take from Rabbi Rush's classes, I try to look into the depthness of why he's saying that so much. Okay, we know complaining is not good. But the problem with complaining, it blocks you from receiving. Number one, it clogs your mind. When you're grateful, gratitude, Rav Nassim says, gives you the awareness. So normally in life, it's normal to be lost in life, it's normal to be confused. The reason why we have to jump to gratitude, because gratitude will give you the awareness of why you're single, the awareness of why that's happening. Because without the awareness, what can we change? What can we change? And that's so, so important to understand. So I can tell you right now, your level of mental clarity is in direct ratio of your gratitude to complain ratio. If you're complaining 90% of the time, you're getting 10% clarity. If you're, grat you're grateful 90% of the time, you have 10% clarity. You have 90% of the time grateful, you have 90% clarity. So re remember, the reason why, and specifically this month, this month itself is, is a month of Cheshvan. This is a month that we have extra, extra energy. This is a month that we're fixing the Nun. The Nun, the fallen Nun. We know that there's two Nuns. There's a Nun that bends, and there's a Nun that's straight up. It's, it's a tendency for a person, when he has a problem, to put his head down and, and fall down, and fall into Yush. What the rectification for the Nun is to go into the straight Nun. Pick yourself up. Go from the Nun, pick yourself up. And this is exactly what we do when we say Modim. When we say gratitude, what are we doing? Modim, we bend down, and right away we pick ourselves up. Because you have to be careful 
before the snake was not inside like it is today. The snake was outside. Now the snake is inside. <laughs> now the snake is telling you everything. It's not outside anymore, the snake. The snake has become an internal enemy. It's not an, uh, it's not an external thing. It's in your head. You are competing against yourself. I hate to tell you, you are competing against yourself. And that is the most important thing to understand. Nobody else but yourself. And I'm going to tell you a very simple parable which will understand how it works in life. There was a guy that was stranded in the middle of the road and he was complaining why nobody's pulling over to help him with his car. And he's beating, beating, beating on the, on the steering wheel. Nobody cares about me. Look at everybody walking through, jump, grumping, and nobody cares about me. Nobody's stopping to help me. And all day long he's complaining and complaining and nobody's getting... He sits in the car for two and a half hours saying how miserable everybody is and how the world is garbage and nobody's helping him. So he says, you know what, after two and a half hours, this is not working. This is not working. I'm going to get the hell out of the car and I'm going to start pushing. And guess what happened? When he got out of the car to stop pushing, the whole world pushed with him. Do you understand that? When you get out of your story, or when I told Toby, divorce the story, when you're ready to divorce the story, we can have a conversation. Because you're still in the car right now. I can't give you pity right now. I can have empathy, I can have sympathy for you, but unless you are ready to get out of the car, the whole world will show up. And guess what happened to this guy on the road? Everybody got out of the car. Because he started pushing. And because he started pushing, the world starts pushing. And that's the story of our lives. The minute you start, doesn't matter if you win or lose, all you have to have is an attempt. Have Ratzon. You start getting out of the car, you start pushing, the whole world will push with you because everybody wants to see you win. Believe it or not, the world is about you, it's for you, but it's not about you. And this is, unfortunately, there's people stuck in the car today. And they're saying, well, my parents didn't pick me up. This one, that. You gotta get out of that story. Everybody wants to see you win, but you gotta get out of the car. And this is so common today. You know why? It's easy, it's an excuse. Who wants to work hard? So you have to think yourself, in an area of your life, ask yourself, are you pushing? If you're pushing, it's just a matter of time till you win. It's a matter of time. But if you're not pushing, don't expect the helicopter to come. It doesn't work like that in heaven. The way it works in heaven is when you move, heaven moves. When you sink below, heaven moves above. That's how it works. So below is above. Kabbalah 101. So below is above. You change your relationship with your creator, your creator changes your relationship with people. You become more merciful with people, heaven become more merciful with you. You give more tzedakah, heaven gives you a break in business. It's not that complicated. Guys, I hate to tell it to you, it's not that complicated, but it is if we're stuck in the car. Then it becomes very complicated. Because all we can see is the car we're in. And this is the root of low self-esteem. And this is where we have to fight for it. You know why? Because we come from infinite. We come from greatness. Our souls come from greatness. So our Creator, even if you've given up on yourself, He will never give up on you. And that's very, very important. He does not give up on you. This is a month. To recognize you need to build resilience. It is not easy being a Scorpio, all those who are Scorpios, but this is a month, there's no distractions. There's nowhere to run. Where are you gonna run to? There's nowhere to run. There's nowhere to run. It's forcing you to look inside. It's forcing you to build that muscle inside of yourself. 
The first thing I can recommend, where I would start, is control, which our brothers in New York have a little bit of an issue with this. In Miami, people don't care. In New York, they do care, but they want to control the process, and they want to control everything. Wherever you see control, you're going to see chaos, period. Any time where you try to control things in your life, you are inviting chaos. This is not the first time somebody tried to have control. Eve, look what happened to her. She brought this order into the world. She wanted to be independent. She wanted to be in control. What happened? She got cut off. Chaos and control go hand in hand. Let me explain to you, this is a common question. Not, I used to be a major control, major. I used to pray, and then I used to check the scoreboard. Okay, what's happening now? Where's the FedEx package? Where's the Amazon delivery? I used to, believe me, when I'm teaching you guys classes, it's because I've already gone through these things. And I've recognized in an area of your life where you have excessive control, there's no space for your creator when you are controlling the process. There's no space. You need space for somebody to come in. You need a door to open, but if you're so busy controlling everything, you will not allow the door to open. You can work hard, but you need to surrender the outcome. You can love somebody, but it doesn't mean they're going to love you back. Your job is not to, I'm going to love you unconditionally, unconditionally. Surrender the outcome. You could be nice to somebody, surrender the outcome. You're not going to guarantee it. It's not a tennis ball. Your job is to show up, do as best as you can, but you really need to know how to let go of the outcome. Because if you let, can't let go of the outcome, after control comes anger, and after anger comes depression, and after depression comes addictions, you name it. But it all starts with control. You have to ask yourself, and just Typical examples, you control, you control pain, what do you think you end up with? Any attempt to control pain, what do you think you end up with? Addictions. What are addictions? Controlling pain. I want to control exactly how I feel. I want to know if I take this, I'm going to feel exactly like this. I want to control how I feel. Addictions, you control, addic control pain, you're going to get addictions. You're going to control others. You're going to get toxic relations. You're going to control your spouses. You're going to get resentment. You're going to control money. You're going to get angry. You're going to control being a perfectionist for failure. Any attempt not to fail, you're going to end up being a miserable perfectionist. You want to control your prayers. You're going to end up not even praying anymore. Let go and let God. If that's one thing I could tell you today, you have to have a better relationship with control. Because the more you control, it's only coming from insecurity. Insecurity does not attract anything in heaven. It just shows you that you are not ready to let go. And this is an area where there's control, there's chaos. Work. I am not telling you to sit there in a tree and just let things happen. I'm telling you to work hard. I'm telling you to go dating. I'm telling you to give tzedakah. I'm telling you to love people. Give it all you got. But surrender the outcome. That little word has changed my life completely. It's changed everything. Because it teaches me, if things are not flowing, it could be that I'm in the way. You let go. You let God. Things go back in order. If everything, if, if COVID has not taught you that you're not in control of anything, and you haven't got that lesson after COVID, like what do you think it was all about? If you, had, if you didn't get the lesson after COVID that you are not in control of anything, and you have to literally live every single day, you have to do, do your best. You have to make an effort. You can't just say, well, I'm just going to watch things to happen. No, you have to make the effort. You have to put the hishtabud, you have to pray. But I've heard so many times, 
Hey Dahlia, I keep on praying and nothing's happening. Did I ask you to look at the scoreboard? How do you know this is what the thing you need doesn't take three months to pray? How do you know what you want doesn't take five months to pray? How do you know that? I don't know the time limits. <laughs> hey Dahlia, I did the 40 day challenge and nothing happened. Stop watching the scoreboard. The Gemara even tells you that a person, there's three things that if a person does, not only does it help him, but it actually goes against him. Number one, shaking, standing on a shaky wall, putting yourself in a, in a dangerous situation. That opens up the books. And they ask you, should you be saved or not? Second, wishing for somebody else to be punished. Not only do they not get punished, but they say, well, you're playing God now. Let's check your books out. And the third thing is expectation and prayer. Actually, it's like having an expectation and prayer is like calling the IRS and asking them, do you mind auditing me today? <laughs> that's, that is, that's exactly what it does on a spiritual level. Do you mind auditing my prayers? Because I'm demanding that I should have been received already. And I'm not getting anything. So all of these things, what they do, because again, control, it does not only benefit you, it actually backfires on you. So sometimes you see people that are so simple, they pray, they let go, and they receive a lot. And others, look, I'm so religious, I did this, I woke up at this, blah, 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 and nothing's happening. You're not supposed to play God. You're supposed to pray, and you need to go get out of the way. And I've seen this time and time. You go on a date, you go on a date, Surrender the outcome. Surrender the outcome. New York, surrender the outcome. That is your new tagline. Surrender the outcome. You know why you have to do that? Because that's called emunah. It's not up to you. You guys are not in control of anything. Anything. When you understand that. Even today, I thought I was the third speaker. I'm not even in control of the third speaker or the second speaker. Even, even today, I thought I'm going to be the third speaker. Here I am, the leg things falls off, and here I am, I'm the second speaker. <laughs> Do you understand how ridiculous? Now imagine if I had my notes, well, I didn't, it wasn't a third speaker, I was supposed to be the second speaker. Ba 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 ba. Why is this happening to me? Shut up and surrender the outcome, please. Let me tell you another fact about life also. Let me tell you another fact about life. How would, you, how would you like to know that your Creator actually is in pain when you don't get what, when you, don't get what you pray for? How, how, how would you think about that? It hurts your Creator not to give you. It hurts him. It hurts. Your Creator wants to give more than you can believe. But the problem is, you're out of bounds. So if I throw you the ball when you're out of bounds, maybe I watched too much football today. If I, if I throw you the ball when you're out of bounds, it doesn't help me or you. You just have to get yourself aligned with what your Creator wants. That means if I, had, if I had one prayer that you should say daily, Creator of the world, I want what you want. I want what you want. If this is what you want from me right now, I also want this. There's no fighting, there's no resisting, I want what you want. If you want this, I want this also. That means whether you make money, you don't make money in the situation, it's all meant to be. I want what you want. And your creator, your creator says, when you make his will your will, he will make your will his will. So here we see the common thing. It's not about shoving the square into a circle. It's about alignment. Am I aligned with what my Creator wants? Yes or no? And if I don't, if I'm not aligned, then I need to pray for the courage to accept what He wants from me at the moment. And that is a huge deal because there's no resistance. If there's no resistance, there's no persistence. Bottom line. If there's acceptance, there's growth. But if you want to fight everything that's happening, 
you're going to have resistance. And I don't understand why. Are we, are we serious? Do we absolutely know everything that's happening? Have you been here? Do you know what reincarnation you've been here? Do you know how many times you've been here? Do you have any idea of these things? Do you have any idea? Do you understand you're not a first-time customer in this world? Maybe I was Moroccan in the past lifetime. Who knows? Well, I don't know. Who knows? You, nobody knows what they were, they were here. You, you have baggage in, in this world. Nobody comes here perfect. You have the illusion of perfect, but you, you coming, we're all coming here with baggage. I hate to tell you, and you have to clean up, part, be part of the cleaning, not be part of the messing it up. How about if I told you, Rabbi Nachman will tell you, that the highest level of knowledge that you can get to is to recognize you know nothing. Hmm. That means when you get to the peak of the peak of the peak, that means you made it, you made it, that's it. You're in the Hall of Fame, of knowing, of knowing, that is when you're going to recognize, oh my God, I don't know anything. So just to make an assumption today, when you're going through something and you give it the wrong meaning, because you think you know what that means to you, based on a dysfunctional thinking from the past, and you give it a certain title, that is the quickest way to stay in the car, forever. So I say to myself all the time, Gedalia, you don't know anything. Constantly. What do you know? Maybe this is for good. Maybe this is not for good. Maybe it's good or not. Who knows? But you don't know. You know, believe it or not, the, 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 we have to convince people in recovery and addictions that they are not God. Do you understand that? We have to convince them that you are not God. You have a God, but you are not God. Even in the money, look at the dollar bill. In God we trust, not in God we control. Does it say in God we trust? <laughs> or does it say in God we control? And if you have a problem with control, you're inviting chaos, and you're inviting anger. How about if I told you that Rab Nachman, he says the word for money is 140. 140. 70 times with the actual letters, mamon, with the actual letters. It's 136 plus the letters. How about if I told you it, would it takes you 70 cries for a woman to give birth, or sages told, tell us, that making parnasa is twice as hard as giving birth. So give, give a shout out to your husbands. So good morrow. Yes, yes. Make husbands great again. Yay! Yay! I've been, I have a specific retainer from all the husbands now. Before the wives would give me the retainer, now the husbands would give me the retainer. 70, 70 screams. A woman has to go through 70 contractions to have a baby. There is no pregnancy without a contraction. No matter where you move to. Even if you move to Vegas, Florida, doesn't matter. The other 70 represents you have to pray that you shouldn't think that this money is coming from your hands. So imagine when is the last time somebody in New York prayed and says, God, please give me the strength to not believe that this money is from my hands. When's the last time somebody prayed to be saved from the illusion that you're in control? And I'm not telling you not to be in business. I'm not telling you, I'm telling you, you have a business, you have mazel, grow, make money, no problem. Give charity. But I'm telling you, you need to know where to put the brakes. And I've seen this in my life, and it's paid off magically. But the areas that I'm sitting there trying to control when things should happen, that is the beginning of resentment, anger, depression. You're fighting against yourself. You're fighting against yourself. And this is where, if you do not have a good relationship with control, you're going to have a very good relationship with chaos. It's exactly what Rabbi Nachman says. The solution for chaos is humility. Humility means surrendering the process. 
not controlling the process. I can't tell you, even obvious things, when you see people, I want to get, get I sent me up with this person. No, right now we're not ready. We're still going to be in a few more months. I can't, you're not ready. What are you talking about? I'm ready. I said, you're ready for a breakup. That's what you're ready for. But I know that person's not ready. But this person, he thinks he's ready. Rav Nachman advises, we cannot have premature ripe fruits. Because if you eat ripe fruits, you're going to get sick. Things have to ripen out. We have to ripen out. But if you're too busy controlling, it's not only does it knock you on an amuna, it makes you angry, and the first person you're saying, I can't stand Hashem. Look what you're doing to me. Your relationship with Hashem is completely different. But many people, believe it or not, have this relationship with, with a God of their understanding that doesn't even exist. It's a dysfunctional relationship. God is nothing but himself. I'm going to give you another clear message in Lesson 172. Rav Nachman says in Lesson 172, whatever lack a person experiences, be it children or livelihood or health, is entirely from the side of the person himself. For the light of God flows upon you constantly. But because of the person, he has certain deeds, he makes a shadow for himself so that God's light does not reach him. Does, not, does everybody understand that? The light is always shining, the sun is shining, but if you have an umbrella, you will not get a tan. The sun shines. So this is an important message, which I'm going to talk to you how to properly pray. Because if you're saying, why am I not getting any light? you so much, you need to work to get rid of the shadows. You need to work to see why the light is not coming in. It's not about, it's not about the light. It's not about God. It's the shadows. For example, if you have a hard time with, with, with feeling things, if you have a hard time with pain, you're going to have a hard time in expanding your vessel for growth. If you have a hard time judging people favorably and not seeing, not understanding people, your relationships are going to look terrible. <laughs> because all they're going to do is who's right and who's wrong. If you are not ready to be merciful, you cannot be in a relationship. If you're not ready to get married, you shouldn't even be dating. You shouldn't be dating. Because you're not, you're not going to, you're not, you're taking somebody's time. Our job is to figure out from what the problem is, what the solution is. That's what our job is. To figure out what is the shadow blocking me. It's exactly what I do when I pray. Creator of the world, there's a blockage here. Please tell me the spiritual cause of this blockage. And there's something in life called, if you come up with a good question, you're going to get a good answer. But if you come up with ridiculous questions, why is it happening to me? You're not going to get the answer. It's funny, we just learned from Abraham Avinu. 75, remember this number 75. He was 75 and he was told, Lechlecha. The word bitachon, which means trust, 75. The word mayeye, what will be? 75. The word lama, 75. Why? Mm. The future and the past. 75, bitachon. It's all there. The answer is there. The answer is there. It's, it's, it's te telling you. Trust, trust, trust. It's there. It's there. It's nothing. This is all obvious. So when I'm sitting there praying and I'm doing my Hezbollah, I am not praying to change God. 
I'm not praying to change my spouse. I'm not praying to change my business. I'm asking God, where can I remove the shadow that you want me to? Because I know you want to give me. So if you want to give me, then I, I need to be in a position to receive. And then when the receiver receives, he can give. Let's say I'm asking for money. And if I'm, I know that if I receive money, I'm going to become arrogant, cheat on my wife, and do this. I'm not going to receive the money because I know it's not going to be good for me. But let's say I want to ask for the money so I can be able to give charity to the right place. And I'm not just saying this because I want to check the box. I really believe I want to give charity. I will receive the money. Let's say I want to get married, not so I can be alone, but I want to really become a giver. I will receive the spouse. But if I want to just get married so I don't look like I'm alone, then I, maybe I won't respond to the spouse. Your intentions is what actually creates the stimulus of fraud. Intentions is what is your ratzon. Ratzon, Kabbalistically, is called, it comes from the energy of Keter, the highest energy. Your desires. In heaven, they don't even, they don't even judge you for the results. They judge you for the desire. So you see here in Lesson 172, he tells you clearly, a person is creating a shadow. It has nothing to do with the light from above. It has to all do with the light from below. And then he says, when God displays a joyous countenance, there's life and good for the world. And this is where the, the Pasuk says, see before you, I am placing Lifnehem before you, a blessing and a curse. The word Lifnehem, which means before you, comes from the word Panim, your face. What's your state? What's your state? So please, stop blaming God for what your ego did to you. That's the first place you start. Don't blame God for what your ego did to you. It's got nothing to do with God. It's got to do with you have a vessel. I want to give. Your Creator wants to give you. But if there's no vessel, what do you want? I mean, what, what, what would you want? He can't give you because it's cruelty. Just like giving somebody who doesn't deserve something, just because he wants to give it, look what's happening in the world today. Are we not enabling people? Don't you think the governments are enabling people? Is it good for them? No. It's destroying them. It's destroying them. It's not chesed. It's cruelty. Anytime you enable somebody, you're actually causing cruelty. You're not doing chesed. Because chesed means you care about them. I'm going to give you just a sample of how you should pray and what are the optics, of what are, what are, what are the situations when we pray. Just so you guys have a, a, a little bit. There are two approaches to prayer. One is a very common prayer, but there's, a very prob there's, a, there's a, some problems with it. And there's usually three components to a person praying. Number one, the person praying. Number two, the situation in the person's life. And number three, Hashem. So remember, the person praying, the situation, and Hashem. Three situations, right? The most common experience that we normally say is we say, please stop the experience, change the experience, or prevent the experience from even happening. Now this is a problem. Why is it a problem? Why is it a problem? Because everything that's happening for you, like we said before, is for your benefit. So believing that something is happening for you by ha happenstance, that itself is a problem. In contrast, what are you saying when you're trying to change the experience? What are you trying, what are you saying? Number one, Hashem changes his mind. Is that true? No. I can change Hashem's mind? Is that true? No. Number three, the experience should change without me having to change. What in the world do you think you got this headache in the first place for? You, you're a random Powerball winner? It just happened to you? It just happened to you the last three times it broke up? You're losing the same money on the last four deals? You're getting angry the last five times? Well, let me just find somebody else to deal with this with. No. Anytime you experience something to happen without you changing, remember, we get things for a reason. 
It's not by happenstance. That also is a lack of emuna. So when I go, the right form of prayer is doing is the opposite. Now what in the world am I really praying for? I am praying for the differences. I'm not asking God to change. I'm asking that I should change. That I should see that situation completely different. That I should see whether it's a difficult family member, that I should say, why is this person in my life? Why can't they remove them? Hashem, what can I change to better this relationship? Very simple. Understand them and don't judge them. The relationship will change. Do not pray for a situation to change without having you change. There's a reason why you're single, there's a reason why you're having financial issues, there's a reason why you're having this. It's not by happenstance. And I hate to tell you, if you really believe this, like Rabbi Nachman says in Lesson 9, that our Parnassah and our Shalom Bait, because they both are related to splitting of the Red Sea, have to do with prayer. Because prayer changes you. It doesn't change the situation. The goal of a good prayer is when you should say, Oh my God, I never saw it that way. I never saw that insight. How does that practically happen? Your Creator gives you awareness when you submit to Him. When you surrender to your Creator, He gives you the awareness. You can't understand it. You can't write a book about it. It just happens. It happens. So this is very, very, very important. I cannot change God's mind. I cannot control God. If you just stop doing those two things, stop trying to change God's mind, and stop controlling the outcome, I guarantee you, you would have Shema coming in the areas that were stuck. Because the opposite of that is surrendering, letting it happen, letting it flow. And the only reason why we are controlling in the first place is because we have, we're insecure. We don't believe. We don't believe. We don't believe in it. If we believed in it, we would, we would just say, what do I know? So this is a message. You cannot change your spouse's spirituality. You're trying to, how many people are frustrated? My spouse is not as religious as I am. Well, maybe you should write a book about it. You'll probably, everybody else has the same story. I can't get my wife to change exactly that. So I ask people, are you the most spiritual person? Yes, of course, I do this, I do this, I do this, I do that. I, I took the, the, the dove off the tree and I did every mitzvah in the whole year. So why are you judging the person? If you're so religious and so spiritual, why are you judging them? Maybe you should understand them and not force them. <laughs> not about the situation. There's a, maybe they're not ready for it yet. But you want to picture them being happy and displaying it, but if they have a nudgic religious person saying, you're not doing this right, you're not doing this right, you're not doing this right, and you're, not, you're making the whole family miserable. Where can I sign up for this religion? Where can I sign up? Anybody have a, an extra ballot for me? And it's funny how Rabbi Rush walked into the room while I was saying that. <laughs> and how many times have I seen this? In Uman, yes, we do go to Moldova, we wait 25 hours in airports, and I eat Rosh Hashanah dinner with the rabbi. And I sit there and watch everybody. Rabbi, my spouse is not more religious than me. Pray that you should see only the good in her. That's, what he's, that's his recommendation. Pray that you should see only the good in her. Should you tell her something? No. But she doesn't keep Shabbat. Shut up. Don't say anything. <laughs> now, the, the rabbi has dealt with a lot more than me and you. Because he knows something. There's an energetic, Rabbi Nachman says in Lesson 282, when you send somebody a good vibration, when you send them good vibes, they pick it up. But when you're sending them bad vibes, they pick it up also. 
And this is why you're not getting what you're getting. Because you have your own agenda. You want to do it, not for it, you want to do it for yourself. So you don't look stupid, or you don't get judged, or your neighbor. But if you did it, with your heart, you would never judge the same person. That's why you got the wrong approach. I only have to really the wrong Only when I first met the rabbi, the answer that I usually got was the opposite of what I thought. You know, when somebody tells you, what, what's the answer? A, B, C, A. No, it's D. It's completely out of what I even thought would be the answer. And I said, maybe there's something here consciously. What in the world is the rabbi doing to sell millions of books? What is he said? What's the catch? There's a bunch of books on Amuna, guys. There's a lot of books on Amuna. It's not the first one. But how many of them say you have to change yourself? How many of them? No, but not many. He takes you off the messenger and makes you focus on the message. The message is you're judging. And when you're judging, you're not getting anywhere. You're judging, forget any change. Opposite. And if you were in a merciful state, you would just give mercy. And this is the problem today that I'm seeing. We're losing, we're losing so much fighting. Why? Judgment. I know better. She's better. I'm this. I'm that. What are you judging? What are you judging? It's such a low vibration. It's such a low vibration to judge. Says, if there's one Torah that you should keep in your pockets, is Azana. Focus on the good in people, you will see the good in people. And if you all did that, all we could do is all we could do is to light our own houses. Light yourself, but remember, you can't give if you don't have anything to give. So once you start lighting up your own, then you become a giver. Stuff, but I think I'm going to do I want to welcome Robert Bush. Huh? You made it perfect. Guys, thank you so much. Thank you, Daniel. You're beautiful.
realises that all their efforts and all the staff that are around him to bring the work back to the world is working for granted. The work that is impossible and amazing himself, I'm sure I spoke about that at the beginning. All the different challenges to make this happen make this even more meaningful. So thank you so much everybody for your patience, your commitment, and a big thank you to Daria for seeing the promotion after the one of the world is next to the other way around with Daria and this is set in that row. So we're going to have one now and introduce the world. Everyone should be singing together as well. This is music on. And we look forward to the rest of our own tour to go to the Canada.com and see how this is going to be shared. Check out all the books in the back. We've got the world of books. Life-changing. That's what we've heard more than anything we've been doing in the last few days. Thank you very much. That's the music. We're going to have a DJ over there. Thank you, Hashem. Thank you, Hashem. Thank you, Thank you, to Hashem for the holy Torah here that Hashem has given us. Everyone say thank you to Hashem for the Shabbos, for the Chagim, the Yom Tevs, for all the mitzvahs that Hashem has given us. <laughs> Everyone say thank you to Hashem for all the righteous tzaddikim that we have. Thank you for the emuna that Hashem gives us. If a person goes in to an antique store, what is the one thing that you're not allowed to say? What's new?
The guy went through a red traffic light. A police officer stops him. He tells him, didn't you see the traffic light was red? He said to him, I saw the traffic light, I didn't see you. Yeshiva Bocha came to his Rosh Yeshiva and he said to him, Rabbi, I don't believe in the Creator, so I'm getting up and I'm leaving Yeshiva. He thought the Rosh Yeshiva would be angry, but the Rosh Yeshiva turned to him and said, I myself don't believe in the Creator that you don't believe in. The Yeshiva Bachi hears what? The Rosh Yeshiva himself doesn't believe? He said to him, what is the image? How does the creator that you don't believe in, how does he look like? So everyone here, so everyone here in this auditorium who thinks that the Creator is scary or the Creator doesn't want good things to happen to you or is not good himself, you don't believe in the Creator. All the people that suffer from mental ailments, it's because they don't believe in the real Creator. kinds of mental ailments, worries, anxieties, fears, sadnesses, it all derives from the lack of emuna. The creator that created us loves us always. I all the time teach everyone to say what is Emuna. And everyone say after me. Emuna. Emuna. <laughs> Hashem, blessed be He, always loves me. <laughs> and everything will always be good. <laughs> and, and it will only get better and better. <laughs> that is a moon.
That is emuna. Every single other thought is not emuna. We need to repeat this again and again and again and again. Adam is not a person is afraid. He needs to tell himself. Why am I afraid? Only good is going to happen to me. Any thought of sadness that has entered you, you need to say to yourself, Nonsense! What am I afraid of? Only good is going to happen to me. Any thought of worrying, any thought that causes you to be afraid or anxious, say nonsense. Hashem always loves me. And everything will always be good. A person can be mentally well and healthy if he holds and grasps onto a muna. Our master and teacher and rabbi, Rabbi Nachman, the son of Fege of Breslev, writes in his book, Likute Moiran, that emuna and the soul are one combined thing. All the mental, all the diseases that we have, the problems that we have with our minds and with our souls, are all because of the lack of emuna. A person can even learn Torah all day long. If he doesn't work on his emuna, he doesn't have emuna. I told about a Torah scholar who wrote a book of halachas this thick, a real Torah scholar. He had a certain difficulty. He had a trial with someone else. He was in great sorrow and in great anger for this rabbi for not coming to come and give testimony on his behalf. All day long he was talking Rosh and horror about this rabbi and this guy. He was really, really sad. On the eve of Yom Kippur, 
He was really, really sad. He thought to himself, how am I going to fast? How am I going to pray? Hashem had mercy on him. He lifted his head and looked at his library. All the books there are brown. But there was one book amongst them that was green. Takes out the green book. It's the book, The God of Muna. Opens it. He starts reading and he sees everything that's happened to me. It's all Hashem. It's not him. It's not the other guy. It's Hashem. All of his sadness disappeared and went away. And because of that book, he searched me, he came to me, and he now does every day an hour of it. He was really a great learned Torah scholar. But he didn't have a Muna. A Muna is something you must work on. Emuna is the greatest thing in the Torah. Emuna is the level of a person in this world and in the afterlife. A man's life is according to the level of his emuna. You have a Muna, you have life. That's why I want to teach you a Muna. Well, I'd like to ask all of you here. I'm asking everyone, those who are married, those who have children, those who are single, those who don't have children, I'm asking you all the same question. What do you want for your children? You want them to be healthy, certainly. That will be beautiful, certainly. <laughs> They will be smart, certainly. They will be happy, certainly. They will be successful, certainly. They will find a good soulmate, certainly. They will have successful children, certainly. They will be rich. <laughs> Certainly. Uh, 
We can write notebooks of all the things we'd want for our children. For all the things a person would want for his children. So believe me that the Creator is at least like you. Think, it's written in the Holy Zohar. That Hashem created the whole world in order for a man to know and to recognize the Creator. It says in the Holy Gemara. That Hashem, blessed be His name, gave us the whole Torah for Emuna. So how is a person going to know who is Hashem? Simple. <laughs> If you're single, no. Certainly the Creator wants me to find my soulmates. At least like I'd want it for my children. I would want my children to find their soulmates. If you're sick, think. The Creator wants me to be healthy. Every single thing. Think that the Creator is just like you. Why doesn't a person not manage to work salvations through his prayer? Because the beginning of Emunah is something that is lacking. Why did Hashem merit me to write many books about gratitude? I wrote a small booklet called The Law of Gratitude. This booklet teaches a person how to say thank you really and truly. How was this booklet written? My son, Rabbi Nachman, he gives classes all over Israel. He told me that a couple did not have children for seven years, eight years, eight years, I don't exactly remember. They learned my book on gratitude. And they learned that they need to say every day for half an hour, thank you, that we don't have children. He told me that they're doing this already for several months. 
And still, there's no children. The woman is not having a child. He asked me, but father, you wrote that if a person says thank you, he sees a miracle. He sees a I said to him, because they don't have emuna. He didn't understand me. <laughs> Father, they keep the Torah in the mitzvahs. Every day they do half an hour of gratitude that they don't have children. I said to him, true, but they don't have emuna. He asked me to explain to him, what exactly do I mean? Why do I say they don't have emuna? I said to him, tell them, they need to know that Hashem wants them to have children. But as long as they don't have children, they need to say to the Creator, thank you for all these years that we didn't have children, because what you want, that we shouldn't have children, is what we want. And even now, as long as they don't have children yet, they need to say to the Creator, you don't want us to have children yet, nor do we want to have children yet. Well, he said to me, I'll go tell them. He told them, The woman said to him, I can't say such a thing that I don't want to have children. I said to him, this is what I said. She doesn't have a muna. He asked me to explain to him how to tell her these things. Before I explained to him, I said to him, True, isn't she sad? So how can she say thank you when she's sad? That's not thank you, that's not gratitude. And not only that, she was also sad all these years. Okay, she didn't have emuna till now, but from now on she needs to have emuna. So tell her, Hashem, blessed be his name, wants you to have children. Because Hashem loves you. Hashem loves you. 
כמו שאני אוהב את הילדים שלי. Tell her that she needs to say, Hashem loves me at least as I would love my own children. I want my children to have children. So the Creator also wants me to have children. I know that Hashem loves me. So all the years that Hashem did not give me children, that was the best thing. She needs to do tshuva and repent for all the years that she was sad. That instead of saying thank you, I was a crybaby and crying about it. So if she believes that Hashem loves her, she should tell the Creator, as long as you do not want me to have children yet, nor do I want to have them. She understood. Every single day she started saying thank you in this way and in this form. Within eight days she was pregnant. Everyone here. Cheryl say that wants to see a miracle and a salvation in anything learn the booklet the law of gratitude learn how to say thank you really and truly a person needs to be embarrassed that he was sad. What is sadness? He didn't have a muna. The Creator is not afraid of anyone. He really and truly loves every single one. And therefore, He didn't give a person what he wanted only in order to bring him to a Muna. He really loves the person. And therefore Hashem is not afraid. He doesn't care how sad you are for how long you're sad. He's waiting for you to have a Muna. Learn the books of the Muna. Learn the books of gratitude. The booklet, the law of gratitude. Learn. Again. Everyone. If you haven't found your soulmate, First of all, Emuna. I always say to Hashem, blessed be his name. I don't want anything. I want only Emuna. 
השם לקח לי את הדיבור, אמרתי לו, את העיקר שיש לי אמונה, לא מעניין, מה שאותו תעשה, אני רק, אני יודע שאתה אוהב אותי והכל טוב, תודה, תודה, תודה. השם took my speech away from me, I said to השם, as long as you didn't take my אמונה. I know that Hashem loves me, and I only said to him, thank you, thank you, thank you. The main thing is not to lose your emunah. A person needs to start speaking to the Creator like this. הבורא, דבר ראשון, אמונה. Creator, first thing, אמונה. אין לי זיבור. I haven't, I don't have a soulmate. אבא שלי, אין לה זיבור. My daughter doesn't have a soulmate. לא משנה, כל אחד. Everyone, it doesn't matter. קודם כל, אמונה. First of all, אמונה. אתה אוהב אותי. You love me. אתה אוהב את הפרט שלי. You love my daughter. כמו שאני רוצה שאלה זיווג, בוודאי שאתה רוצה. Just like I want her to find a soulmate, certainly you want her to find a soulmate. הדבר הזה, תודה. So the first thing, thank you. אין, אם אתה מאמין שהשם אוהב אותך, If you believe that the Creator loves you, you say thank you from all your heart. Because you say to the Creator, As long as you do not want me yet to find my soulmate, I also don't want it. אז אחרי זה אתה אומר, גם אני לא עושה, אתה יכול להגיד תודה מאמת. And then, only after you say, I also don't want it, only then can you say thank you really from all your heart. עוד פעם. Again. אני, אני, לפני שאני מתקדם, חשוב לי שכולם ידעו בעל, בעל הפה, מה זה אמונה. Before I'm progressing, it's important for me that you all know by heart, what is אמונה? אמונה. אמונה. השם יתברך. השם, blessed be his name. Always loves me. And everything will always be good. And it will only get better and better. Who said a man here? The translation is Gavan. Excuse me? If I say Oron Kodesh, you're going to say Amen. I'm going to say Chair. You're going to say Amen. No translation either. I'm telling you the reality. That Hashem loves you. And everything will always be good. 
That is not a blessing. It's reality. Hashem wants only good to happen to you. That's not a blessing. It's a reality. Just like I'd now say, chair. עכשיו, הנקודה שהסברתי שעוד פעם, הזוהר הקדוש, לקודה מרן, לקודה אחות, כמה פעמים כתוב שאנחנו באנו לעולם הזה The point that I said again, the Holy Zohar, the Likutei Muaran, the Likutei Alachot, they say several times, the reason that we came to this world is in order to know Hashem. I gave you a code. How do you know Hashem? I gave you the code. How do you know Hashem with everything that you go through? Think. What you want for your children, that is what Hashem wants for you. That is the beginning of the true connection with the Creator. There's a midrash that says that Reuven saved Yosef the righteous one. That is what it says in the Chumash. It says in the Chumash. Reuven said to his brothers, Why should we kill Yosef? Let's throw him into the pit. And his intention was in order to save Yosef Hatzad. That is what's written in the Chumash, in the Torah. The Midrash writes in the Torah the Midrash says that if Reuven would have known that the Torah would have written that he wanted to save Yosef, his brother, he would have put him on his shoulders and taken him straight to his father. A question. What Ruven would have done that for the covet, for the honor, if he would have known the Torah would have written, then he wouldn't have done it. Heavens forbid. The Gary Rebbe explained this, explains this beautifully. And Hashem granted me to explain it in even a better manner. Everyone 
מגיע אדם בשביל שאין לו אמונה בעצמו, אם היה לו אמונה, מה, מה, פחד, פחד, אם היה, יגיד לאחים שלו, לא, לא טוב, לא טוב, לחזור לאותו רבאדה, פחד שלא הסכימו. The Midrash comes to tell us, to tell each and every single one of us, that Reuven didn't believe in himself. Because Reuven was afraid that if he tell his brothers that he wants to go and take Yosef to his father, they wouldn't listen to him. Reuven should have believed in himself that he can save Yosef. And he can save him completely. That is the message. Everyone who is afraid of doing something because he's lacking faith, emuna in himself. Why is he lacking a moon in himself? Because he doesn't believe that Hashem loves him. And he doesn't believe that Hashem wants him to succeed. אם אתה מאמין, השם אוהב אותו, והשם רוצה שאני אצליח, ואני אעשה, יש לך כל הכל, רק לעשות כל דבר. This applies to everything. If you believe that Hashem loves you and Hashem wants you to succeed, you will have the power to succeed in every single thing. כל דבר שאתה רוצה ללמוד, ממש להגיע, לעשות כל דבר, ממש כל חסד, כל... תאמין, תעשה את עצמך. It applies to every single thing. You want to learn, you want to do anything. Believe that you can do it and you will succeed. The Midrash writes another thing. The Midrash writes that if Aaron Akoin, Aaron the priest, would have known the Torah would have written that when he went out to Moshe, that he was happy in his heart, he would have come to greet Moshe with drums and with singers and with dancers. And again, Aaron Akoin is holy above holy. רק לא האמין שאדם, מה שהוא עושה, זה ישמח את משה רבנו. But he didn't believe that what he does, that when he came to greet his brother Moses, that would make him happy. כי משה ראה את אהרון, היא רוצה לקראתו. Because משה רבנו saw Aaron as the elder brother. אז הבין שאהרון שמח. So he understood that Aaron was happy with Moshe's mission. We need to strengthen ourselves in this point that we can do more and more, just like Aaron Akoin. This whole Midrash, and it's also written on Boaz, 
מי היה יודע שכתוב בו שנתן לרות המואביה את החיטים עד הנתון לעגלים. That if he would have known that it would be written in Megina's root, that he gave root the wheat and the barley, he would have given her calves and all these different delicacies. This whole Midrash comes to teach us that when a person wants to do something, he will do the maximum that he can, the best that he can. And he will succeed. Now let's go back to the most important thing that I want to teach you. Prayer. I always teach. If you believe, you speak to Hashem. If you don't speak, you don't believe. The prayer that I'm speaking about is the personal prayer. That all day long, all the time, you should speak to Hashem. Say thank you for everything. And ask for everything. But in order for prayer to be complete, a person needs to have full and complete emuna. So what did we learn today? That is called full and complete emuna. You want to pray for finding your soulmate? If you want to pray for a soulmate for Torah, you start speaking, Creator of the world. I know that you love me. And you want me to be able to work salvations through my prayer. It says in the Likutei Moharan that Hashem created the world because He saw there are going to be righteous people who are going to pray and through their prayer work salvations and that's why He created the world. It says that you will have a pleasure and a delight from that that a person prays and works salvations, Hashem will have from that a pleasure and a delight. So all of The Creator wants us to succeed in our prayers. The Creator wants us to work great salvations and miracles. And 
And the thing that brings the goal of the redemption closer than anything else is a muna. Rabbi Nachman writes, know that the main reason we are in exile is because of the lack of emuna. Therefore, everyone needs to work on emuna. It brings closer your private redemption and the general redemption. I don't know why my clock is running fast. There's time, no? When a person says thank you to Hashem, that opens all the gates. Come through Hashem's gates through thanking and gratitude. Who does this belong to? To Hashem. So you say thank you for Him allowing you to use it. So all the time say thank you for every single thing. When you say thank you, you live the reality that this is Hashem's and He allowed you to use it. So every day you need to do an hour of it bodedut. That is the greatest gift that there is in this world. Every day a person has a personal meeting with the Creator. It's important to learn the books, the Garden of Emuna and all the books. I say and I pray. Every single one of you needs to be good. How does a person become good? You learnt a book. You learnt a booklet. It changed your life? You have to spread it out and distribute it. Even to non-Jews. Everyone has to believe in the Creator. There's nothing that makes the Creator happier than when you distribute a Muna. All the mitzvahs of tzedakah are important. But the greatest tzedakah in the world is when you give books to others. Books on emuna. And you spread emuna through the world. 
like Avram Avinu. So everyone here in this hall, you need to spread emuna. To live emuna and to spread emuna. And they will merit the Mashiach, the son of David, shall come with great mercy, without any wars, without any agony or hardship. Soon. This is a song. It's either Emuna or Hell. Okay. It's either Emuna or Gehenna because without Emuna, you live in Hell. You're looking these people? 